Welcome everybody. Um, thank you for coming to this lecture. Uh, I will briefly uh, introduce uh, Hank, who will be giving a talk titled uh, "Shelter." Hank comes from Hank Wildhut. I, I, I tried to pronounce his name, but it's impossible. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so Hank came from Amsterdam today, and he will. He's been working on a very interesting topic. Uh, he's been actually almost living for a while in, in Calais and he's been documenting the migrants. Um, he studied in the Nag at the Royal, um, the Royal Academy of Art and uh, his work is um, uh, has been exhibited quite recently. Uh, the work that you will see tonight has been exhibited at FOM, uh, one of the uh, major institutions for um, for photography in Amsterdam. And um, he will uh, talk about his experience having started a project on migrants in 2005. So being a long time in, on the uh, on the topic. And he will also tell us something that we sometimes are not aware of, you know, how the media have given us information that is not so true. So we welcome Hank to the lecture. Thank you, Hank, for joining us. I will start, uh, uh, I will lead you uh, through the last 10 years I've been working on this topic. My work started on, in Pakistan uh, in 2005. I, I was assigned by uh, Medicine Sans Frontières um, to make a, a documentary about a, a disaster area in Pakistan. Just um, uh, um, happened a big earthquake, and um, uh, over there, the, 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 um, uh, the people uh, tried to pick up their lives. So um, I came in Pakistan, and um, I, I needed to do my, uh, my work. But I'm not a, a reportage photographer. I'm a documentary photographer. And the, the, the difference between documentary and reportage is that um, I see myself as like, um, uh, first, the, the, the stormtroopers come in. The, those are the, the war photographers and the disaster photographers, the reportage photographers. And after that, uh, uh, people who try to make uh, sense of all the mess are coming, and that's my job. So I can reflect on what I see. But at that point, I came into a place where there was um, um, a, a crisis going on. And I, I found it really difficult to relate my, myself to this, because I saw different things. I, di I, I didn't see people crying the whole day, uh, putting up their hands, uh, hands in the air in despair. I saw um, uh, people smiling, and I saw uh, people going on with their lives. And this was something um, uh, you never see in the media. And at that point, I, I started to realize that, uh, that, uh, uh, that this was something which was quite interesting for me. And so I came, to, I came into these um, uh, tents and, uh, where people um, try to uh, organize their, their life again. And this was actually one of the key uh, pictures uh, from that, that series. This was a, a tent camp from the uh, Red Cross, and at that, that day they created this small garden. So they, they put in flowers and they tried to make it a homely atmosphere. And that, that, this image was for me, it was like um, an, op uh, an, an eye opener. Because suddenly I, 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 I looked on refugees uh, in a disaster area in a different way. I mean, they were just like me. You know, they wanted to create a home. Uh, they wanted to, uh, to show that they were still uh, humans uh, and not only victims. So I came home and I showed this work uh, to a magazine and um, uh, they were really surprised about it and, uh, uh, and they, they, started, they published it and there was actually a lot of critic, uh, criticism around this work because, you know, how can you uh, show pictures of uh, um, uh, like this or uh, like people creating a nice atmosphere in their, in their refugee tent uh, when you go to a crisis. You know, people expect from me as a photographer that I come back with these cliches. So um, uh, then 
I thought, well, let's investigate this a little further. So I, 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 I wanted to go uh, to other refugee camps in the world to see uh, if, if this uh, was uh, more common than I, uh, I thought. But then I read this article in the news about um, Pakistani and Afghani people living in the forest in Calais. And this was around in, in 2005. So I thought, you know, you know these Pakistanis, they came from uh, Pakistan, and they came all the way here, so I don't need to travel that far. I just can go to Calais. So it's easy. So I drove. And then I came into this forest uh, where people said they're hiding in the forest. And I immediately, I, this was one of the first pictures I saw, and it, it blew my mind because my first impression when I saw it was, whoa, this is beautiful. But then you think, oh, wait, wait a second. You know, this is really bad. And I, how can I t think that this is beautiful? But this dual uh, idea about beauty and about um, a, a disaster or about a bad situation was a mix that I knew immediately that, uh, that I could tell a story around, a different story than uh, we are used to. So I went, I went into, this, uh, into this forest and I, I looked around and I started to focus on how people create um, a home in this uh, very harsh situation and how, inf how creative they are with stuff they find uh, in, in the woods or whatever. So and there were other things also I discovered that like African people, they build up uh, round tents and um, uh, people from Asia, they b build square tents. So like there was also an anthropological aspect on, on the site. So I've been, I've been looking around through this forest and then um, I decided, Okay, I'm, uh, I saw Calais, but now I want to investigate uh, further what's going on in the rest of Europe. So I, I, I traveled around, and, and this is actually in Patra. Uh, so I've, I've been uh, going around Europe to see um, uh, where other spots were, uh, would be, like where people were gathering around, temporary, uh, finding for temporary uh, shelter. And so I discovered a few places, but also uh, I, I discovered that some stories uh, I, I could not tell, or they didn't want to tell. So like, like making a story like this, it, it takes a lot of um, thinking and seeing how do I, do I make a story, uh, uh, how do I tell this story? So uh, like looking for the narrative is a, is a very long process to find the exact uh, exactly what you want. So I shoot a lot of pictures, and most of them, most of them I don't use. And some of the, uh, then at that point you think, well, this is interesting. And then you look at it a later stage, you think, no, it's not interesting because, and what kind of reason uh, there will be. So um, th this is uh, these images I took in Spain. And I think this is an amazing image because you see here, like uh, uh, they, they, they build this uh, from materials they found. And another thing I discovered, like um, most of the temporary uh, um, areas where people build houses are close to places where building materials are. So um, I, I became a sort of pathfinder, or you know, like uh, when things are coming together, I knew. It could happen that there would be a camp, and most of the times it was true. So this was near a dump site. So when you see a dump site, you see places where trucks are coming together. Uh, I knew I had to find out. And yes, I found this, uh, this spot where some uh, immigrants were, were building a temporary shelter. So here you, you don't see it in this image that well, but they made like a, um, a roof from uh, pieces of um, um, uh, 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 pavement. And yeah, it's, it's amazing. Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, yeah. This is in, in Malta. Another thing I, I really I started to focus on it was private domain. So like people, they are they are very, they are they really um, uh, they need their own space. So even if you're an immigrant, you know you need your own space. So it's, uh, uh, in, in this, this area was a big warehouse. Everybody was, was building their own uh, uh, shelter inside the warehouse. So this is also something, uh, I focused on this because 
me, as, a, as, as not being an immigrant, I can relate to this. You know, like my, my children, they built like these private spaces in my, in my kitchen. You know, they put like a cloth, they put it around the table and they, they build this. So, you know, like it's something I can imagine uh, I would also do. So, and this is also one of the reasons that I, I left out pictures like this. Because this is in, in uh, Rome, and um, uh, I wanted to show you this because, you know, I, I, sh I shot pictures like this, like big groups, big masses of people. But I realized that when you see a picture like this, you as a viewer, you think, you know, like all these people, you know, like uh, you, you, it's difficult to relate because you think it's them, it's not me. You know? So when you make it more personal, like one-on-one -on -one or just leaving out the portrait, just, uh, then it's easier for a viewer uh, to, to think about your, uh, what would you do. You know? So this, this is the way I, I, uh, I start building my narrative around. You know? So I left, I left all the side ways um, and I, I narrowed out my, my view uh, every time a little closer. This is also in, um, in Patra. So uh, after a couple of years going around Europe, uh, not always, I mean, I, I, I do other assignments, but so like a couple, of, a couple of times a year, I started traveling, finding places. So after I started this whole project in 2006, and then I came back after, the, after all these places in Europe, I came back to Calais again because Calais was the place where uh, everything came together. You know, uh, and why? Uh, because Calais is like an, a funnel. That, that's the right words, right? This is this. Huh? Okay, it's like a funnel. So um, uh, when when something is going on in Europe or in the world, you know, uh, there are always people who want to go to England, but there is this canal uh, uh, you can't cross, you know, so it's, it's a water barrier. So um, uh, people are just uh, uh, going to this one place and surface, you know. I, I, uh, normally, in, when, you, when you see in, in, in big cities like Rome, like Paris, there is always illegal immigration, but you d just don't see it. You know, it's like um, a hidden society. But in Calais, they needed to surface. So they, they, for me, it was always interesting to go there. If there were troubles in, in the world, it reflects in Calais. So uh, after, uh, this is in 2009. I came back, and uh, again, there was this uh, huge uh, uh, increase of uh, migrants uh, in, in the forest. And um, I, I took pictures, and it, um, but uh, for me it was all already uh, started to be clear that the situation it, it became so big that the police was going to destroy it. So at the end of uh, 2009, or September 2009, they destroyed the camp at that point. So this was actually the third time they did it um, in Calais. So this, this is just before the, the camp was destroyed. But what I, I really like about this, uh, this image, this, this interior shot, that uh, the guy who made this, this, um, uh, this, this interior was almost an interior designer. You know, like, so, you know, like, because it's, like, it's deliberately made. I mean, you could have put the balls like this or like this. No, he, deci he decided he wanted to have it straight. Another thing, which, what I also, because you have to realize that these guys, they leave, they leave these uh, shelters every day uh, without the idea never to return because they leave every day uh, the place to go to the channel or to go to the, um, the trucks uh, and hope to reach their goal to go to England. So, but even then they keep it tidy, you know, and they put their jackets on the hook and, and who taught them this, you know, their mother. So, you know, like, and I, I think that's, you know, it, I, when I see it, it um, I get this very warm feeling, you know, because I can, I, suddenly I see this mother going like, Ahmed, put your uh, jacket on the coat, uh, on, the, on the hook, you know? Like, and my mother always tried to do it with me, but she never succeeded, you know? Like, uh, it, look at this. There it is, my jacket, you know? So, <laughs> but Ahmed's mother was very strong, that's for sure. And so like, like this, what you see here is like almost like um, um, a, a boy's room, right? But, but the reality is that this is only like 
a paper thin, you know, and the harsh reality outside of this, this, this cloth is just, you know, that, that's really a different world. And this also, like, um, you know, like, they, they, you don't need to put it on a wall, but they just did, you know, to make this uh, a, a nice, nice place. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, something else, but uh, this is actually one of the few images in the, because I, my work is divided in two parts, like shelter, that's the uh, one I, uh, I finished in 2010, and, uh, and the new work I'm going to talk about now, or almost. So like this is, um, uh, there are only a few people in the work shelter, and that's because I, I, I uh, took out all the recognizable faces because it's not in their interest to be taken, to, to, to be uh, portraited, because you know, they want to be invisible. And I don't need, I didn't need to show them because I showed the persons through the shelters. Of course, you know, you make the work and then you, you, you want to ex expose it to the public. So this is one of the, I really like this exhibition. It was very big screens in, uh, in a city called Breda in, in Holland. So the screens were six by nine meters and, and it was on a, a new square uh, designed by Rem Koolhaas, he's a very famous architect. And my work was reflecting to his, his work. And um, what you see here <clears throat> is that the people, these people, they're living in these houses. And they, uh, just before the exhibition was finished, they came and, and took pictures. And I was there. And I, I walked up to them and I said, do you like the work? And they said, yes, we really like it. Uh, you know, it's just unbelievable how, the chil how these children can make these, uh, these huts in the, in, the, in the woods. And I said, yeah, yeah, it's really nice. But it's, there are no children. There are illegal immigrants in Calais. And the, these people were shocked because all these, these weeks they've been thinking about, about children making these, these shelters. And I, so I knew that my mission was succeeded because it was exactly this, this thin point, you know. So uh, if they would, would not have known, ever known that it were uh, refugees, my mission was not succeeded. So they, had, they needed to know. So I was happy. So uh, I brought these big cloth, you know, I mean, this very thick, uh, high quality material, I, uh, you know, what, what can you do with it? After, after an exhibition like this, you, you can never e ever ex exhibit it anywhere else because nobody is crazy enough to do it. So I brought it to Calais. So here, actually, you see the, uh, in, in, the, in the corner, you see the image. Um, this image is in, on the roof of a mosque. So, and, and you see like more, more patches, that, that's my work. This, is, this picture was taken um, uh, minutes before the police came to destroy it. It's, it's been shot by a helicopter. So then um, uh, I, finished, I finished the work. I'm going to skip it very quick, otherwise it takes too long. And, but I made a book called Shelter. Uh, you see here, it's sold out so you can't buy it. So, but anyway. <laughs> Oh, sorry. So this was um, this was an introduction, actually. Um, so after this project, I decided to go to real refugee camps because I only saw the informal refugee camps. I call it transit camps, and so I wanted to see a real refugee camp. And one of the first things I saw when I came into this UNHCR refugee camp in Jordan uh, was, uh, were gardens, you know, like, uh, so I thought, whoa, you know, like, uh, I thought it was only a one-time thing I saw in, in Pakistan, but actually it's, it's more common than I thought. So this was a garden in uh, Tunisia. And then um, I, I published this work, and then a professor from, uh, from the US uh, contacted me, and he said, oh, I saw your work, and I really like it. And you know, I, I do already for 15 years research to, to the Deviant Garden. And uh, so then, and he said, you know, like these gardens, they're a phenomenon uh, in, in disaster areas, and especially um, uh, also in the, in the First World War, in the trenches in Belgium, uh, soldiers were making small gardens, um, uh, even if they, they knew that they would never eat the, the, the lettuce or whatever, because their life ex expectation was like a few days or weeks or not more than this. But they, they wanted to see something grow, you know. And this is something 
I, um, now I realize that people in refugee camps, they, they, they want to feel their own, uh, that, that they are in power from themselves. They can just create something, they can see something grow. It's not about food or whatever, it's only to feel a human, you know, like not being, uh, de uh, in the, being independent, just creating something for yourself. So this is a, a side project. So I, I thought actually at that point, so now I finished it, and I, I wanted to focus on, um, on the, the gardens. Uh, the, that's an, a project I'm going to do now. But then in January 2015, um, uh, the, the wave of immigrants were coming uh, through the Mediterranean Sea. And it brought me back because I thought I, w I, I was finished with the subject. But then I, I started to realize that this whole focus of mine on individuals, uh, what I always did with the shelters, was um, um, a, a subject or approach from the history. And suddenly I, I, I saw uh, in the news many times all these boats. And at that time, I think in January or February, this big ship sunk. I don't know, do you, do you still remember? Uh, with 300 people on board, no, 700, a lot, right? And then I saw an, an image like this. It was not exactly, exactly the same, but, but uh, I, can't, I can't find it anymore, but I, I will describe it. I saw this, uh, this cartoon of this um, Dutch illustrator. And you saw this boat on the Mediterranean Sea filled with uh, ISIS uh, warriors, you know, with flags. And it was, uh, was written like um, uh, the immigrants are coming or something. And suddenly I realized, from, oh my God, you know, like the, this whole, the whole uh, idea about refugees is going to mix with, um, with uh, the war. So, and now I, I started to think about like, like immigrants are actually uh, the, um, the soldiers uh, from um, a force which and they, didn't, they don't even know it, you know, they're, they're going to be uh, used or abused by the power. So this was stuck in my mind. So what do you do? What do I do? I go back to, um, to Calais. But first, um, um, so I, I spoke with my editor. I work for a Dutch uh, newspaper. And I talked with him about my ideas and uh, also about my fear about the masses. You know, like if you talk about mass immigration, then there is a whole different uh, perspective if, if when you talk about a few immigrants. So he said, OK, you, you just go and research. And I, I said, OK, but this time I want to do it in a different way. I want to focus on, on the power behind immigrants, immigration. And actually, I wanted to focus on the police. I went to Hungary. Uh, uh, Hungary, how do you pronounce it? Hungary. Uh, I went to Hungary. Uh, and I made an appointment and I was uh, allowed with them to, to travel with the police officer to the borders. And this is not my picture, I, I took this from internet. I'm now, now I'm going to show you some pictures from the media. Um, uh, so and so when, when at that point when you're talking about immigration, I just uh, put random like uh, uh, border Hungary uh, on Google, and this is what you see. You know, you, you see like masses crying women. It's always like this. This is like a classic, right? I mean, you can just put this on to whatever kind of war crisis. It's always like this. So like. It's disaster. It's just um, um, a, a terrible situation. And this is also very interesting, I think. This is the same moment from two different angles. So it shows that the, the, this photographer is not alone. There are probably there are a dozen around the same thing. So you see, like, 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 uh, like, like all this media attention and every every image we see is like uh, it's only like despair. It's like masses, and I felt that I was influenced by this same um, overwhelming amount of images and uh, and ideas. So this is another um, uh, uh, image. This is also at the border, just just be, uh, hours before the, the Hungarian border was closed. Uh, or sealed off, you know. Then there were just big um, uh, riots, and people were just uh, were uh, wanted to uh, storm it and climb over it. 
So these images are not my thing that I try to explain you. So how, but how do you relate to this? I, I, I was pretty much confused at that point, you know, how, because I was in the storm, you know, like normally I always behind the storm after the photographers were gone, I was there. So like this happened and I, I needed to go there, so I drove up to Hungary and uh, I took a picture like this. So this was uh, four days after what you saw. And, um, um, and this is, is another picture. So again, you don't see any people, but it gives me as a, as a, uh, as a viewer uh, much more time to look at this. You know, I can, I can contemplate about it. And, uh, and when you see a picture like this, you think, oh my God, you know, this is terrible. But uh, you know, it, it doesn't, for me personally, it doesn't feel like um, uh, my life. But this actually, uh, this affects me because now I see this is Europe, you know, this is the Europe where I live in. You know, I live behind these bars, you know. So that's a different way of looking at it. When I saw this image in real life, you know, I was shocked. I, I was standing there uh, looking at, uh, because I'm in Serbia now. This is Hungary, this is Europe, this is where I belong. I was outside. And I thought, okay, so this is how immigrants look at Europe. And so like this is the border. This is also not my picture, but this is, this is the, the, the same picture, but for me. And I was also like, this is a highway. This is a, uh, you know, like this is the first time I saw a European highway just sealed off by, by these, these fences. And this is like, um, um, the, this is the reality at this moment between um, uh, Hungary and Serbia. So I, this, this is uh, like, this is, this is another thing. I was in Hungary in, um, in June. And I took this picture, and I, so this, this was my first trip to Hungary. And uh, this is, so I, I was uh, with this police car, and we drove around, and at that moment, there was this um, um, radio thing, or I think my editor texted me, like the, the Hungarian parliament decided to make a fence on the border. And I was actually on this border when I got this text message. So I told this policeman next to me, I said, they're going to make a fence here at this point. And he said, no, they're not. They're not going to do it. I said, no, it would be really cynical. Eh? You just, you, you just uh, get rid of this fence and now they're going to bring it back. And he said, no, they're not going to do it. But three months later, it was there. So and it, it's the same. at this point here, I, I had this conversation with this police officer. So I immediately I knew I, knew, I need to take this picture of this landscape here. And three months later, it was this. So for me, like uh, images like this are just uh, iconic uh, moments. And, and in, I mean, also as a documentary photographer, you don't I don't need all the. Um, uh, excitement of people running around, uh, uh, going under the fence, but I can just uh, use the plain uh, content. So this, uh, I, I flipped back and forth. This was uh, Calais again um, uh, in March, no, this was February uh, 2015. So I was busy with the idea, the mass immigration is coming. I wanted to see what's going to happen, what's, how it's reflecting in Calais, because I told you Calais is like a thermometer or, uh, for the situation in Europe. So I went back to Calais after two years not being there, and I, f I saw the forest, the first image you saw, uh, you know, and this is almost the same spot, but then uh, uh, almost 10 years later, and the forest was filled with people. But also, at that point, uh, people were moving suddenly. Uh, to, uh, they, they had to leave from the police. They had to leave the old forest. You see here, I don't know, are, are, are any of you campers? Do you camp outside? No? We Dutch people, we like camping. You know, we're always at the camp. So this is like, like a classic for us when you've been on holiday. Putting your tent up for three weeks on the same camping spot, you take your tent off, you know, and this is what you see. So for me, it was like nostalgia. Only this is a, a different ball game. I mean, this is the refugee camp. And, but why did people move so suddenly? Because they had to. So here you see. So in my work, I, I used the same thing again. I went over and over to the same place. So here you see, uh, like they had to leave this place. 
So uh, here the nature is coming back and this is um, the situation um, uh, eight months later. So nature is taking over, but where are the people going? You know, the, the situation was not gone. They, they went here. So this is, this is a picture um, I took in February by accident because I saw these guys walking around. And so they, they, they were walking around, they didn't know why, and then, oh, sorry, oh. And they were starting to build up this camp. So this was in March. So, um, and here you see like the street uh, where, they, where they had to go by, uh, by force for the police. They said, you have to go to this area. So I came back a month later, and then there was tarmac on the on this same, same spot, and one month later, there were um, uh, light poles. And a couple of months later, it was actual street, you know, and then um, uh, it was really busy street. So this is a, this is a um, uh, time lapse for, this is, I think, December, and the other one was March. So you see how quick it developed. So here, the, uh, we go back to this image. Here you see the, the, the dunes, and this is, uh, the same spot, exactly the same spot. But then um, uh, this is in December and this is in March. So this is the situation, uh, what happened in, um, uh, in, in Europe or in Calais in the last year. So this is, a, a, I took this from the internet. This is also, the, I think this picture was taken in, um, if I see, in, in June. And this is, uh, in January last year. So another thing, what, what happened, wh why Calais changed um, is because of the fence. So if you, so the, here you see the, the, the camp, this is in, um, I think, uh, July, and this is in um, uh, September. So in July, they started building the fence. So what happens if you, if you seal off uh, a, a space? Then people know that we can't leave that quick, you know? So they, they know that they were, suddenly they were building like everywhere fences. But one thing didn't change. So the, 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 the possibility to cross to England was changing, was more difficult. But their hope or their, their aim didn't change. So the only thing what changed is that there is a fence and people were, were starting to dig in because they knew we're, we're not going to move here uh, uh, very, very soon. So, um, so people started to build. And this was a new, new thing. I never saw something like this because people knew that this temporary shelter you saw uh, in, the, in the previous work uh, was not going uh, to be enough because the winter was coming and maybe they would be there for, for a very long period. So uh, suddenly a new layer on this whole, uh, whole camp came and they were starting to build shops. And, um, and uh, so and this is a good example. I took this picture in March. And if you see the right, the right uh, hand structure, over there, th this is a shop. And over there, so, so, so this was just like a random place. The light pole came. And because the light pole came, it became more safe. And people start to make shops. And uh, it, it actually became one of the main squares. And uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, I think, in last January. So this is also an example of the church. You saw it before. The church is, is also one of the main uh, spots in the, or was one of the main spots in the camp. And it also became uh, the center uh, because people were starting building around. So the Eritreans started to cling around, uh, uh, around the church because they, uh, this is the Eritrean uh, church. And so this is almost the same spot. So you, see, you can see how incredibly um, uh, this camp expanded. So this is the interior of the of the church. So here, this is a, uh, also a very cute scene, I think. This is a, 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 the part of the Sudanese. And Sudanese people, they really like to create gardens. And that, that's what I discovered 
in here also, like the, the, the gardens you saw in, uh, in Tunisia were also Sudanese. So the Sudanese, they, they, they really liked uh, a homely uh, atmosphere. This also, I, this is, I mean, for me this is um, an example of a deviant garden. I mean, here you see like sand, and they just put these patches of grass in there. It, it lasted only like a week because then the, the whole uh, place uh, uh, changed again, you know, like so. But so even then, even if it was, it was only for a week, they, they created this thing. So in, uh, with the building of the fence, what I told you, uh, people started to really uh, no, uh, started to build. So um, uh, the, the tents, what you see in the back, they were slowly moving uh, by uh, uh, solid structures. And everywhere you saw, saw building material coming. And this building material came from the local um, uh, Brico. It's like a, a hardware store. And um, I, I just roughly calculated how much this store must have earned in the last year. It's millions. Because every shop you see uh, spent around 5,000 euro on building materials. And only, uh, only in shops where uh, I counted, uh, just like only in the main street, I counted uh, 43 uh, restaurants. I counted 45 uh, grocery stores, and there were hammams, and, and you know, they, they, all these people invested in this, in this short period. And then, I, then there were numbers, uh, numbers of, uh, of, of uh, housing things, and they've all been bought in this one uh, grow, um, uh, building material shop. So th there was this huge amount of uh, building activity. This also, I mean, this was one of the, the finest restaurants, I think. This guy has been building in this, on this site for almost one and a half months. And he was really a, a good craftsman. And uh, his restaurant looked like amazing. You know, like, uh, and, and the story is it's a little sad story because he, he was really into it. He really wanted to make something different because what I told you were uh, 43 restaurants. And he actually had chairs and uh, paintings on the wall and uh, the sockets were just built into the wall, you know, like, all, and, like the food was amazing. He decorated it when you ordered the plate. It was like nicely made. And he finished it and he spent like uh, um, uh, 7,000 euro on the, on the whole thing. And three weeks later, it was destroyed, you know. And, and, and I asked him, you know, what do you, uh, this is the guy. I asked him, you know, uh, oh, it, it must be very painful for you. He said, no, you know. Well, that's the risk of being an entrepreneur, you know. You know, it's just, and but you know, this this really blew my mind. That that that, that, that so what what you saw like um, what I what I always focus in in my work is the resilience of people. Like they you, they are not they they don't want to be presented as victims. I mean, they 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 have so much power, you know, and they can just create. A city in um, in a few months, you know, if you let them grow uh, on an organic uh, way, uh, or, uh, organ the, the the organic growth of the city, you know, like just let it go, and this is what happens. And this is also this is also um, uh, one of the popular restaurants. Uh, oh yeah, this is also a very good story. At one point, uh, the tandoor uh, entered Calais. So one guy, uh, he, uh, he thought, well, you know, uh, let's uh, import a tandoor oven. And, um, uh, and this became a huge success. I mean, you know, like, so, like after a month, there were 11 tandoor ovens in the camp. And these guys, you know, they earned four. No, they, they, they didn't earn, but they, um, um, uh, well, they, they, they sold like eight, 800 uh, tandoori breads a day uh, for 50 cents each. So like, uh, like one, one of these guys, uh, he, they, made, they made like 9,000 euros a month. You know, like, like it was big business. And um, uh, so like this is, this is one of the tandoor um, uh, guys. 
And so like, like the business came in, but what also was interesting, people from outside started to realize, hey, we've got this camp, you know, people are just stuck because there's fans. So maybe we have to start a business. So people from outside the camp who had like legal uh, had papers, they came into the camp starting to build businesses like restaurants. And then uh, at one point, and then uh, there was this moment. So th this was like the free state until I think half of November. And then the police and the government started to, uh, to, to they, they, sh they were shocked what happened. So that because they were, it was out of their control. So they wanted to gain control because at that point, the police was only standing outside. They never entered the camp, you know? Um, so at that point, they decided, OK, we, we need to gain our uh, control. And so they started to enter the camp once a day in a patro patrol, uh, going in and out back to the cars because they were very scared. But also, the, the tax man came. So they, they started to, uh, to uh, go to the shops and ask for their papers. And some of the guys, they actually had papers. And then they started threatening them and said, you know, you, uh, OK, you have your business. You have to pay tax. And so then the first um, restaurants were sold immediately because uh, you know paying tax was not their their idea so they sold their uh, businesses for 10000 euro or whatever so there was a real real estate thing going on um, so this is the hammam uh, one of my favorite places i always got to shave here and so like a hammam uh, is like a bathhouse so you could buy a bucket um, so one bucket was um, uh, oh no you pay 3 euros and then you got, I think, two buckets uh, of warm water. And uh, so like this guy, actually, when he opened the, the he wanted to, to, uh, to have the competition with the other hammam. So he said, you know, three euros for as much buckets as you like. But he had to stop this because he was almost out of business because of it. And um, uh, so th this is also this example of a shop. And this is uh, the shopkeeper. And he, um, he actually, the, the thing what they, they do, uh, they earn their money with tobacco, basically. <clears throat> so they, um, they buy these, uh, these big, uh, big uh, volumes of uh, tobacco and they fill the cigarettes themselves. And I think they, they sold like 3,000 cigarettes a day. So one euro for 10. So that's also pretty good business. And this is Noor. Um, so what you see, like, uh, because I, I spent more, so much more time than I did before in the camp, I started to, to have friendship with people and I started to hang around at one, uh, certain points. So that's also why there are more portraits in the new work than in the, in the old work. Because, uh, you know, it, it felt for me almost normal to, to enter the portrait in the work. So Noor, he had a shop. And I come back to him later, but uh, keep him in mind. This, this was actually the first restaurant in um, in the in the camp, and you see, like the, like that, uh, at one point business was going well, so try they they were starting to expand. So here there was an, an, an extra um, uh, corner in the in the restaurant. This was a little later. Oh, I see that it's hmm. okay. This is also an, an interesting phenomenon uh, because the, the people were making money, you know, um, and uh, what you saw in the first uh, period, uh, people just going into the area, taking a piece of land just randomly, just putting up uh, their, their hut or their tent uh, at a point. But then suddenly you had like this main street, you know, so and suddenly people were making money next to you. So, you know, your tent was valuable because this guy actually was on the square, you know, and um, um, uh, and this guy I knew it was Aziz. He, he had his tent pitched up there, but Aziz um, was jailed because he cut the fence and he was um, uh, caught, and they put him in jail for five weeks. And when he came back, his tent was gone. Uh, his land was sold by the, the neighbor, and they started to build up, build this place. So actually, this this piece of piece of land was sold by his neighbor for 900 euros. So the average rate of uh, a piece of land uh, was uh, between 900 this square, but if you have a big restaurant, it was 3,000 euro, just like that. 
So, but then what I told you, then the tax man came and also the insecurity came uh, because they, they started to uh, realize that the camp was not going to last forever, but it was going to destroy it. So like some people were selling their, their, their restaurants. <coughs> And then, um, but other ones, they, they went on, and also again, they, here he put like this extra corner. But then, but slowly, but slowly, uh, um, uh, the pressure by the government was, bu was building up, and they are, were uh, going to destroy it. So in, um, in September, um, no, uh, in February, March, um, it, they were starting to, to um, uh, make an effort to destroy the, the southern part of the camp. And so in the media, uh, they created this idea that the whole camp was destroyed, but it's not true. It's only like one part. Oh, this is a little off this. But another thing, uh, I'm going to show you a, a, a sequence. I took this, this, this um, uh, shelter from, from a top view. And what I, what I think is interesting is that like, if, you, if you talk about like, architecture or about ar archaeology, it's always like the history uh, is a long period. But in, uh, the, the history in Calais is very short, but like, um, the changes are enormous. So also when I, talk, when I show people who are actually living in the camp, show people from the, the beginning of the camp, they couldn't believe it, even if they lived in it. They thought, you know, this camp is already existed for, for 10 years or five years, but it, it, it isn't. So if you see here, so like this is in uh, October, and this is in, uh, I think, January. On the right corner, you see this plastic bag um, here, over there. So, like plastic is something which is flowing uh, uh, very easy, and then you go and you, you you still see it, you know. But a huge cha change happened, you know. But the plastic is still there. So, like like uh, so for me, you know, like uh, like th this is where uh, where it's all about, you know. The, the, the changes are quick and dramatically, but li like these really small, vulnerable things are still there, you know? And this is also um, um, one of the, uh, from the Sudanese camps, and I took this picture because I, I really like this plant. He had this plant outside. So I, I, I was taking this picture of him, uh, no, not of him, of his, his, uh, his shelter um, with the plant, and suddenly he came out and he started posing for me. And then, Four months later, the, uh, I came back and I saw this tent again, and I knew, you know, um, uh, oh, I took this tent again, but this was during the demolition. I was pitching up my camera in exactly the same spot, and then he came out again. And, but, but this is at the moment that he had to leave, you know. So here you, you see the, the, the CRS, the, the riot police, and the, the, demolition, the, the, the demolishers are there. And he carries all his stuff and he goes outside, you know. It broke my heart but, because this was actually everything he carried, you know. And the same with this, you know, like you see, like uh, this, this uh, you're putting up your, the laundry and then... Uh, it's gone. So like uh, the, the, the demolition of the camp is now in full speed ahead. And um, uh, this is one of the, the images. Uh, when I saw it, I immediately knew that it was a very important image because this tells, for me, it, tell, it tells everything. You know, like you see the inside. It's like, like a dog on his back, you know, like uh, it's very vulnerable. You can pet it, on, you know, it, 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 it's surrender. So it's, it's, uh, it's the camp in surrender. The surrender is not like, it's, it's, uh, there is uh, something on it. Because, you know, what I told you before, you know, they don't like to be presented as victims. And if, they, if, they, if there is a, a, a point that there are victims, they would like to uh, gain their own control. Even with, you see it with, um, with the, grow, the growth of plants and creating gardens uh, to, to have their own dignity. So what happened when uh, police came uh, with force to uh, destroy the camp, they burned their own uh, own, own huts, uh, or the, you know, because 
I would do the same, you know. So, like, why, you know, why you, you would wait for for a demolisher to do it? You can do it yourself, you know. And then sometimes they just throw in a ga gas can or make the loud burst, and you know, it's, so it was like a, a, an act of resist resistance, I think. So this was the bulldozer, and they bulldozed everything flat to the ground. So here you see the church. In, um, in an abandoned situation. So here again, we go back to this first image in uh, February, and uh, this is uh, December, and this is, um, uh, I think, end of January. So they, they destroyed the first part, and this was uh, three weeks ago. So now, um, uh, so now they're going to destroy the other part. So this again, what you see here is the camp we saw before. So now um, this, this area is gone, but the, 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 the top area is still there. So uh, uh, many people just left, but uh, also a lot of them just moved up there. So this area, I, did, I don't have a current image from it. It's totally filled now again. So and over there you see the, the, the solution the French government made for, for them is con the, the container uh, housing. So, but uh, they only built for 1,500 people containers and there were, at that point when they built it, were like 7,000 uh, people in the camp, so it was never enough. So this is um, uh, the, the current situation at this point. So here we see, again, the, the square. And this is, oh, sorry, this is mixed up. This is the street. Um, and this is the street now. So the, the, the street burned, uh, that, that's, I forgot to tell. During the, um, the demolition, um, one of the guys, he burned his own tent, what I told you before, uh, but uh, there was a, a couple of gas cans in his tent, so it burst, so then a big flame came, and there was a lot of wind, so the whole um, uh, street, what I, what I showed you before, burned in, in a couple of hours. And this is the, the street uh, uh, two weeks ago. And this is Noor's shop. I, told, I, I showed you uh, Noor before. So this was his shop, and this was the place where I always uh, had my lunch. And um, um, Noor was at the end of the street. And so his shop was almost burned, and the, uh, the, the fire came to here. So I came there the day after the fire was there. And um, uh, so he, he took out his stuff very quick, and uh, he evacuated. And then uh, 12 hours later, so after the, the fire, he was rebuilding it again. You know, and you know, when I saw this, you know, I, th I, know, it's, I thought it was amazing. You know, that, that, some, that this power is exactly where it's all about. You know, so and then I came uh, three weeks later, and this is the same spot. You know, so Noor, this is Noor's place now. And uh, his business is driving even better because uh, it's more, much more condensed and uh, he's one of the few left now. So he's like the king, you know, he's sitting there, you know, it's just unbelievable. But I mean, this is exactly where it's all about, I think. So we can see immigrants as um, uh, some people think, you know, like they're only here to profit from our uh, well-being. But if we just see the potential, you know, like of, of people and what they can do, you know, like uh, then there are so much more uh, positive sides on it than only uh, uh, think that the, that they're coming here to take everything we've got. I mean, you know, like uh, they can they can cope, but you know, I think that this whole situation in Calais is very confusing because when you see it, um, it looks nice, but it's of course it's like. Um, a, a black spot in Europe. I mean, it should not exist, and it should have never been there. If a government is just putting uh, uh, people aside, you know, and just leaving them there, they can just cope. That's that's something I think is very uh, um, positive. Uh, a small positive thing in this whole horrible situation. So this is a, a shot of the exhibition I made in, uh, in, in foam. Uh, it's, it's opened now three weeks ago. So this is one room. I've got four of this, but this is the main area. So I, um, I put a lot of pictures, 150 in this room only. 
and I put them on screens or uh, blocks. You know, I so said like every uh, there are three sizes. So the portraits are on a, on a block uh, like this, and the big image is on four centimeter blocks and eight eight centimeter blocks. And um, so it, it gives you the same uh, patchwork feeling as like the camp when you see it from above. And I wrote uh, by, with, um, with, um, on the wall um, w uh, the, uh, uh, the context of the image. So it, it's a really dynamic um, um, exhibition. And people are really reading. Uh, so they are, uh, they are lo for a long period in the, in, the, in the exhibition to read all the lines. And that's, that's quite rare because normally people rush through. But now they're really interested, and for me, that's very nice to see. So th this is, um, yeah, it's quite new also for me to do it in this way. And I also use video, but um, I, 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 I was not able to show it now because it will take too long. Um, no, so I, I took videos of, of very uh, normal uh, daily situations, so not, not, again, no, um, um, uh, excitement or just just uh, uh, and so you get if, as a viewer you really get into the uh, feeling of the of the camp all right uh, yeah well and, um, I'm there <laughs> are there any questions how did you how did I do it with the time? Hi, my name is Catherine. Hi. And um, you said that people build churches, groceries, and restaurants. And um, but what about children? There are some schools or areas for them. Uh, how do they grow up there? How do they live? And. Yeah. Uh, second uh, it's a personal question and at the beginning you said that uh, how do I tell the story uh, how do you decide uh, what's interesting and what's not uh, what's yeah. your uh, goal your message yeah. thank that's, you that's a very good question because um, it's difficult to decide what's interesting and what's not and also uh, for me um, uh, children are not interesting, to put it very uh, bold. <laughs> you know, I, I, I will show you, it's, uh, I will try to explain, you know, because uh, it's also very hard to decide what is interesting and what's not. Because I see a lot of tragedy, you know, and what I show you is uh, not reality. <laughs> is my reality, is the, the way I want to focus. I only want to focus on, on, on strength and on power of people, you know? So uh, I, I, I decided to only focus on the, on the, on the entrepreneurship and on the, on the people who are not going to sit and just wait, but just make something out of their lives, you know? And so I needed to skip a lot of things. And one of the things I skipped are children because uh, it gives you, uh, immediately, you, you enter the, the, the danger of uh, the cliché and of the, um, of the, easy, uh, the, the easy way of scoring, you know? Like, um, forgive my English, but, um, uh, you know, like, like so, like, I, I, need, I always need to focus on what actually I want to, to tell and what I need to leave. And uh, so, for example, you don't see any riots, you don't see any police beating up people, you know. I saw it, it's there. But uh, it's not my um, focus. So it's the same, what I try to explain with the images in hung Hungary, you know, like the, um, the bleeding person uh, who have been fighting with the police. It happened, you know, I, uh, but um, uh, in my opinion, uh, there are photographers who can do it much better than me. It's not, uh, it's not my thing to, to do, you know, I, I get confused when I see it. I don't know what to, how to relate to it, so I, I need to focus. So my, my, is my view. When you were in um, photographing the shelters that you shot at the beginning of the presentation, how were, um, what were your interactions like with the people who lived there? 
Because you have some interior shots and a lot yeah. of exterior shots. How did you relate? I, I always ask. Most of the time, not always, but uh, uh, but um, you know, like um, yeah. So I in interact, of course, you know, like. Uh, but I only I don't show people. So it was also always very surprising for them also because I always ask them, please, can you step aside? You know, I'm, I'm not interested in you. Come on, you know, I'm mean, in interested in your shelter. You know, and and they were uh, sometimes very happy. And then I I could just work, you know, and then I knew that I was no no because. There are many photographers who sneak around and just take pictures, and they're very scared for this, and I understand. So I always try to explain, you know, I'm, I try to tell your story without showing you. So, but I, I also had a situation that people were actually sleeping next to me, and I take pictures uh, of their interiors, asking their friends if I could do it, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, talk more about like the layout um, of Calais, meaning um, did people from certain countries stick together? Um, like did Syrians live next to other Syrians? Like were there certain areas where people from the same country kind of shared or did people just kind of move wherever? No, no, like, like what, what you saw in Calais is that the Calais grew organically. Uh, I don't know, is it the right word? Organic is something else, like, yeah? Organic, Organic growth, eh? yeah. <laughs> okay, it grew biologically. <laughs> no, no, it had an organic growth. So people just, they, 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 they went where their friends were and, and new friends were coming. So you had like a group of um, uh, people from uh, Afghanistan, but in Afghanistan you've got different tribes, so it was divided by tribes. So everything was just uh, it was little communities. But when the, when the demolition came, all the communities were all piled together, and then big, big problems are there at this moment. You know, a lot of fights uh, because you know it's it's really it's, you know, there is a lot of racism uh, in the camp, and um, uh, yeah. So it's that's an, at this moment is a big problem. They had to go, uh, so like uh, what I, I showed you, like the, the southern part is destroyed and they, they went to this northern part, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, they just, yeah, yeah, everybody has a place to live. I mean, or like they, they all live together. I mean, so uh, before they had a shelter for like themselves or for one friend and now they live with four in one, you know, like so it's, everything is more condensed. Because the, the, the only way to, to deal with all this shit for them is that they're very confident that it's going to happen for them. I mean, that's something that's, uh, I learned a lot from this. Uh, you know, like they're not uh, connected to Calais itself, you know, because they built this place. What I told you, like this guy who made this shelter for uh, this, this restaurant for 7,000 euro. It, it was destroyed and he said, you know, yeah, that's the way it is. Because it was only a matter of time that he knew that it was not going to last or he would go, would leave, you know. So they always have hope that at one point they go to the other side. I'm always very scared of the moment that they, that they lose the hope, you know, because hope is just an unbelievable big power. I mean, people can survive as long as they have a little hope. And even if it's totally, totally um, uh, uh, naive, because I think you know many of these guys, they are they are very naive. That it's, because I, I personally I don't think most of them are going to make it. You know, and uh, but yeah. So they have a lot of hope. What is their hope to go back to Syria after things, or no, their, no, they, their they, country, or settle in Europe and no, start they, a life no, in they, Europe? They're in, they're in Calais with the only reason that they want to go to England. So, like, for them, for the people in, in Calais, the only uh, mean of aim is going to England. And they, uh, they sacrifice everything for it. I mean, they don't care. I mean, and one, yesterday, uh, one of the guys I know very well, he was at my place, you know, and he wanted to actually he wanted to try from Amsterdam, 
you know, and I said, well, okay, you just go ahead, you know, you can use my hub as a, as a, a stepping stone. And I knew that it was not going to happen, but you know, like, like so they try everything. You know, like at one point, I, I said to him, to, to Aziz, you know, as a joke, you know, I saw we were driving in a car uh, around the harbor of Calais, and I saw this, this ferry uh, uh, lying there waiting. And I said, you know, why don't you go and try and swim to it as a joke? Eh? And he said, oh, I tried it, you know, <laughs> last week. And it was January, yeah? it was very cold. I said, last week? Are you crazy? I said, yeah, you know, what did he say? And something like, no pain, no gain. No. <laughs> like this kind of wisdom, you know? But you know, like, like it's just unbelievable. He's, he's been lying there on an on a, um, uh, airbed for uh, half an hour in, in the harbor trying to, to swim in the night to this, uh, to this boat, and then um, uh, he was caught, you know? Yeah, well. And this is daily life. Da every day this happens to them. It's just unbelievable. Hi. Hi. Um, there was one photo in particular where there were UNHCR tents at one of the camps, and I was just wondering where that camp was in relation to the other, and how your experience differed when there was a UN presence involved. Oh, the, the, the UNHCR camp? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the UNHCR camp and the camp in, in Calais is uh, a, a, to, a, a total opposite in, in a sense, but even uh, not completely. UNHCR is organized, most of the time <coughs> militarized. I mean, there's a lot of security around, you know, and the guns are not pointing outside, but inside. It's also very cynical. And um, Calais is like an uh, anarchistic place, you know, like, um, uh, so it's like organized from within. It still is a refugee camp and where people are stuck, you know, and, um, and, and but the, the main difference, and now I think about it, is that in the UNHCR camp, people are de depend, they are in depending on, on the decision of governments. You know, like they're waiting until they get the papers to go wherever, you know, or they're waiting for whatever to, to the crisis to be solved or, um, you know, whatever. But in, in Calais, they depend on their own dream. And they are uh, independent uh, of fulfilling it or just reaching the goal. You know, so like they have this enormous drive of just going every day, uh, walking two hours towards the channel, trying, not succeeding, walking two hours back. So it's just unbelievable. And th this is something you don't see in the UNHCR camp. So that's the big difference. Um, this is more of a personal question, but yeah. um, you talked a lot about the differing roles of um, a documentary photographer versus like a photographer who's on the front lines. Um, how did you, was there a point at which you identified specifically as a documentary photographer instead of the former? So one more. Was there like a point at which you decided to be a documentary photographer specifically rather than just a photographer? Yeah, I, mean, the, I don't know exactly the point when it, when it happened, but I was always interested in um, in, um, in in a different in, in telling uh, a story, and um, a reportage photographer is always is actually trying to uh, make an image for a story. Because yeah, you, you've got a story in a magazine or a report of, or a newspaper and you need an illustration with it. So I, 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 and I don't like to relate too much to the news because the news is something, you know, I, I, I always like to ask questions around the news. Is it really true? You know, so, and this is what I, um, what I do. So, um, I, I follow the news, but I, I question it, questioning the news. So then you become a documentary photographer, <laughs> because I can tell my own story. I, I'm, not, um, I'm not a journalist, a little bit. It's a pleasure. <laughs>